Starts there. Tom fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it that I missed? You'll find out, won't ya? Uh, won't ya? I was gonna review it. Won't ya? Oh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an episode seven of Dudes Watch a Movie um, Halloween Edition, as you might notice from all the decorations adorned everywhere. Um, that being said, we are here to talk about the well-known greatest horror movie, as some may say, others maybe not so much, um, The Shining. And I am Betts Brockett, joined by... The Notorious G-I-N-G. And I suppose, as starting out, we should probably talk about who are some of the, uh, the cast members, if those who don't know, who haven't seen it. Um, well, I mean, the main <laughs> character, Jack Torrance, played by Jack Nicholson, who always plays a character named Jack, uh... Probably should be the first place to start because he really, it, it's his movie. Really? More is. than anyone else. Um, I think the only reason this movie works as well as it does is because of how crazy Jack Nicholson does look. He just, half the time, he looks like he's a crazy person anyway. So if you put him in that role, it's going to do just fine. Um, I'm going to run something past you because there, as much as I do like this movie, one thing that I fucking hate about it is Shelley Duvall who plays who plays his <laughs> wife is awful <laughs> just I everything she says every face she pulls grates me so bad um you think Jack might be feeling the same way maybe maybe um <laughs> the, the only scene that she really really pulls it out is when he's chopping chopping the door the she's door. just losing her shit uh, and I kind of feel I feel a little bad for her because uh, apparently Stanley uh, Kubrick just tormented the shit out of her. I don't remember correctly if, if he didn't want her in the movie and they forced him to put her in so he picked on her or he just didn't like what he was getting. But if I remember right, he just he just tortured that poor woman. It sounds like a Kubrick thing to do, especially after hearing what he did with uh, Clockwork Orange. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, no, um, I kind of noticed that too um, with Jack... Nicholson, Jack Torrance's disposition throughout the whole movie, he seemed extraordinarily irritated with her as a, <laughs> I don't know, actress maybe, but maybe it's not actress, just how he's supposed to feel towards her, or maybe it's a bit of both, you know, like maybe he actually was I mean, fond of her, I mean it would help absolutely with, yeah. the, with the acting, but no, she wasn't my favorite to say the least, I, I think though her oddities and her weird and strangeness kind of fit the narrative, maybe? Mm. And it does help that she doesn't look like your standard Hollywood, like, way too fake pretty. Yeah. Like, it definitely makes her seem more of a legitimate person. Real wife. <laughs> um, and then the, the, really the third only key member of the, the cast would be little Danny Torrance, who, <laughs> again, is played not by, not the strong suit there. I, th- I did notice while looking up characters, he's played by Danny Lloyd, Danny Torrance. I was kind of wondering, is it just is that <laughs> they all go by their first name? Just to make it easier on set, I don't know. He, uh, I mean, he's probably like seven or eight, so I can't, I can't fault him too bad. But he, he, he does a good job for what he's doing and how old he is. I True. think it's again interesting that he had no idea he was making a horror movie <laughs> during that whole thing. I don't know how they pull that off. They're or, just like, yeah. I don't know what they were telling him. Like, hey, this scene, I want you to look scared, but you're not scared because it's not a scary movie, kid. Maybe he's just normally a creepy kid all around. Could be. I mean, <laughs> I, who knows? Um, the the only other real person of interest on there would be um, the caretaker. Not the caretaker, sorry. The, the chef. Getsman Carruthers yes. Dick Halloran. And, uh, Dick Halloran. <laughs> he is... Only reason I really want to talk about him is I, I love the name Scatman Carruthers. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's so it's like weird. He was born to be a Scatman, but instead became an actor. Yes, and I I like the little rapport between him and Danny, where he's just trying to be super helpful, and and Danny's just like, okay, <laughs> I don't feel good about you. What's up, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing. It's so weird. Little uncomfortable kid. Yep. 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 Um, and I guess we could also talk about uh. So the, the man that hires him is Stuart Ullman, who I always thought was kind of weird. His name 
when Jack says it, sounds like omen. I thought they said almond, to be honest with you. No, he's a little nutty. I it was almonds. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. But I, I, he says Mr. Mr. Ullman, and it sounds like omen to me, which I thought was interesting because he basically tells them the history of of what happens at that hotel and is like, hey, hope you guys don't have an issue with cabin fever or the idea that someone chopped up his family and I hope you guys don't do that same. NBD, whatevs. Whatevs, whatevs. <laughs> um, but I was, like, he doesn't look like a real person. He looks like a character, uh, like a, a Republican candidate or something mm-hmm. with, like, his hair and the way he dresses. Mm-hmm. I feel that 100%. <laughs> uh, is there any anyone else that shows up in that story that, that really stood out to you? Uh, I suppose the barkeep um, towards the I guess later middle at part where uh, Jack is losing his mind and starting to drink where there should be no booze. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he, he was a little odd, but I mean, he just had his one little bit. But. He was in the movie twice, actually. Mm. Yeah. Must have missed that part. Yeah. yeah. He, uh, I think part of what makes him so strange is, and I, I was watching, to, I couldn't quite decipher, but I swear he's got no eyebrows. I swear there's no eyebrows on the bartender. I guess I didn't really pay attention to that. It's one of those, I can't tell if he just has really thin or faint eyebrows or if it's blonde or something, but it looks like there's nothing there, which is part of what makes him so creepy to me. Um, Mm -hmm. And after the bartender, he does then meet uh, Mr. Grady, who was the aforementioned uh, carekeeper who chopped up his family with the axe. And then shot himself. And then, yeah, uh, I believe he unloaded both barrels into his brains, is how they describe it, something similar to that. Which, I mean, maybe it's understandable for the times and for makeup and effects. I think that they lacked a little bit on that for the uh, part, but... Well, see, the problem there is if if he walked up to him with a giant hole in his head, it would have been pretty obvious right out of the gate who it is. That's part of the big reveal is after he spills the, the drinks on him and he's cleaning mm. him up in the bathroom, he he asks him, uh, what, what, what was your name again? And he's like, oh, Grady, sir. And he's like, Grady? I suppose, yeah, okay. that's true. Okay. okay. Well, he does see him, well, does, I don't know. Nope. Was it him or was it his wife that sees him in the hallway with, it looks like he's got a split in his head. His wife sees him later. That's what it is, his yes. wife, yes. Um, she sees him. Uh, I guess, I mean, that's all I care to really talk about, uh, character-wise and things like that. Um, a big character itself, though, to me in this movie is is the Outlook Hotel. Yes, absolutely. It's just, for Bing, as big as it is, it does feel kind of claustrophobic because they keep going back to those same sets over and over. And yeah. It... it it's, I think it's the idea that they can't really go anywhere, just kind of in the back of your mind makes it makes it feel Feeling confined. Feeling isolation. Yeah. yeah. There's um, there's obviously with how much, uh, how many, how much people like this movie, they've done so much analysis on it and dug into things here and there. And one of the things that I found most interesting was somebody took the time to to try and figure out the layout of the hotel. And it turns out it's it's impossible. So they by analyzing the film and using reference points and the way the hallways should line up, it doesn't work. Like there's just places that go nowhere and things that would overlap and stuff like that. Which I think we were talking about that before. I, I feel like it. I hear this all the time, you know, with with certain directors. It's not by accident. <laughs> when Kubrick, of all the people, I will give it to him. It might not have been an accident, but I. It, again, would be one of those things that you don't necessarily perceive, but can add to that kind of, that weird vibe going on. True, yeah. I don't know for sure, but it's, it's an interesting thought. With having the movie analyzed as much as it is, yeah. I mean, like, but at face value, I don't think anybody would notice that right off the bat. Um, but I did notice, like, as soon as he goes into Allman's office while looking on the outside of the hotel, like, they go in in the middle, and then he takes a step forth and goes right where that office technically is. That window wouldn't technically be that's one of the, displayed that's outside. That's one of the big things they talk about. So, um, then throughout the the hotel, there's a couple key key rooms that you revisit. So one is Jack's writing room, which is the big open area. That he's got the typewriter mm-hmm. in. Um, and I guess throughout this video, I'll just keep bringing up the theories because um, one of the big things is what the fuck was this movie about other than just the surface level of man going crazy killing his family due to cabin fever um so one big theory 
that people talk about is, I guess, I don't know if it's big, but it's one that I've heard. Um, it's about the genocide of the Native Americans. So in that giant room and throughout the movie, um, you even see uh, his wife. I cannot remember her name right now, so I'm just calling her Shelly. Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> um, Wendy's wearing um, a jacket with a bunch of Native American designs on it, and there's a bunch of other designs scattered throughout that room on the walls, on the carpets, things like that. Um, and then even in the, the storage room, there's a Native American on the side of oh, one of those. The food canisters. Yeah, one of the bins. I'm just talking about. I don't know how it's supposed to tie in to it being about genocide, but they do bring up it's on an Indian burial ground. And so I think that might be the like a subtle reminder that it's on the area, Indian burial ground, which could be causing that bad juju. Um, the other big room, though, um, at least I guess there's a... There's so many. There's so many. Ballroom. That's where I was going is that ballroom. Um, I think in terms of just movie sets, it might be one of my favorite ones just to look at with all the gold everywhere, especially when he goes in there alone and it lights up and you've got the red bar. Um, I think the contrast there looks really nice. Yeah. I honestly wasn't a big fan of a lot of the color schemes only because there's a lot of pastels. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of pastels, but I mean, for the times, it is what it was. But the gold and pink, I just... Eh, the gold, okay, I can understand, but not with not with pink. The mustard yellow jackets yeah, that they're wearing. Like, the sum of the wallpaper. No. Nah. In the 70s, they like to dress in their favorite condiment colors. <laughs> if they spilled, you wouldn't know. <laughs> um, the I'm going to say the, the third big room is room 237, mm. which is one that... He's not supposed to go into. The exactly. Because it just happens to be unlocked. Um and it's the room where he, he gets attacked and there's um, some other bad entities going on there, which is, they don't ever fully explain that, but my guess would be, might be the room Grady was staying in, maybe? They yeah. don't, it's another one of those things that never gets fully explained, but it's definitely a room with, where bad shit happens. Um, to the point where that, the big documentary that goes over some of these theories is is called 237. Mm. Um and the, the music video for The Kill by uh, 30 Seconds to Mars. Same thing going on. They make a big deal about a room. Oh, I make connections now. The yeah. weird room. Yep. The weird rooms in the movie's video. Okay. Your okay. what the fuck scene? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing the ball against the, the wall when he has writer's block. Although I honestly thought that would have been a lot of fun had I been him. Mm -hmm. He was literally a baseball chucking that ball at that wall. Um, was there anything else about the hotel that kind of stood out to you or that you want to... You want to go over? Um, not so much the hotel, the maze. Mm -hmm. um, that outside thing, I did catch right away um, where they first started exploring the maze. The outside map was very simple looking, but then when it goes to Jack Torrance looking at the model of the maze, it was much more convoluted, a lot more squiggles, a lot more turns, mm -hmm. a lot more dead ends. Um, so I don't know if there was a purpose for that, if it was supposed to be that way, or if it's just kind of like, eh, why not? See, I'm not sure for that either. There's, with it being a movie about losing your mind, you have to take anything that Jack's looking at with kind of a grain of salt. True. And it almost seems like he's, he's to me, daydreaming about them walking around in there, so I don't know if, if that's a subtle hint that, hey, he's losing his marbles, because that's not anything what the, the actual maze looks like. I'm not sure. Um, also, my thing with hedge mazes, like, can't you just walk through the shrubs? Or are they really that tightly bound? Or That I don't know either. <laughs> I've never been in a shrub maze. I would like to go. Apparently, they have one that they've erected out at the, the Stanley Hotel, I believe. Hmm. If I remember reading that correctly, which would be cool. Um, we kind of talked about Kubrick a little bit. And I want to go back to that. Um, there are uh, a couple of things that jump out to me as kind of his things he's well known for. One point perspective. And I figured you'd want to talk Ooh. about that. Yeah, uh, I wrote it kind of in there, things I liked about it. A lot of the cinematography I was a good fan of. Um, from watching other Kubrick films, I've noticed he does a lot of uh, establishing shots, nice long shots that kind of just take you to where it is. Um, granted, with the score, really setting the scene for being ominous. Like mm -hmm. even the intro with the horn, I don't know if it was horns or synths, probably synths. But it's just, you're brought into this world, it's big, expansive, wide open, and then there's just kind of this ominous tone that's going over this family that's traveling somewhere. 
And that's where kind of those tribal drums will come back into, which mm. is another thing about the Native Americans. That would make sense. Um, and then I notice a lot of the hallway shots, the very first scene also when he goes into Ullman's office, like it plays out from the the, scene, the perspective of the doorway. So you see everything kind of focusing in the middle where Ullman's sitting and then they're just the two of them are talking. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of really good tension building in there too. I've noticed a couple of scenes to help build up the dramatic tension was the heartbeat that was going on in the background, mm -hmm. um, which maybe was the drums. They also have the the use of Danny going from the the wood to the carpet to the wood to the carpet yep. to the wood to the carpet with that kind of erratic uh, tension builder as well. Um, one of the big things with this movie was the steady cam. So a lot of those shots where they're walking, don't know if it was the first movie to use it, but again from recollection, it's it was a, a rather new invention at the time. So going up the stairs or those those tracking shots going all the way walking through the office or taking the tour of the hotel. A uh, big thing about that, to me, that helps it kind of s feel more current is that they had that steady cam so it's smooth. Otherwise, a lot of movies back then, you would be on the tripods or mm -hmm. more static shots. And I feel like nowadays you have so much motion in cinema that that's one thing that immediately makes it feel like an old movie to me if it doesn't have that. I, can, I, I think maybe if I'm thinking of the right the steady cam, um, the, uh, the shot when they're in the pantry, the dry pantry, when they're kind of following, they go behind the shelf every time they mm -hmm. kind of pan through there. So it makes me feel like the one of those impossible shots that Tommy Wiseau shot, but not really impossible. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, I, I I would have to say there was a lot of really good, I, I don't know what you call them, the ones that follow the people around. Just a uh, tracking Tracking, shot. yes. Yeah. There's a lot of those in there, too, which helps kind of take you with the characters through the story. There's another... Um, choice that he made that I, I I liked a lot that I never really picked up on before until this viewing is there's a lot of fades between scenes and I always just kind of ignored it previously because it's it was fairly common to do a, a fade between the scenes mm -hmm. but in some of the shots where they were showing the the characters there and they were just kind of lingering it almost makes it seem it gives it more of a what did I write about it like they're kind of frozen in time like it almost makes them appear slightly ghostly so when you know what the story's about and by the end re-watching it again it kind of makes sense the idea that they say Jack you've been here the whole time which I don't know for sure if he if that's the case or not or because timeline wise it would make any sense but it does help kind of push the idea that that they're replaying previous events that have already happened there. That makes sense. Um, and they, um, uh, Dick talks about it. He's like, sometimes places can shine too when they, they have like a moment stuck in time or whatever he says. And I, it makes me get the feeling that, that we're almost seeing a past event while the, the hotel is empty. Maybe it's not really happening. Maybe it is. But then they, they have outside, um, connections with uh, mm -hmm. Dick and, and going to rent the, the ski, the, the snow cat and all that stuff. Mm. But it's, it's an interesting idea. Okay. Uh, and the third, or I guess not the third, I don't know what, what number we're on here because I'm not good at keeping track of things. But another big thing with Kubrick and theory-wise, somebody thinks that this movie was his secret way of admitting that they faked the moon landing. Is it because of Danny's shirt? His Apollo 11 shirt. <laughs> the, the My favorite one here is the... <laughs> so when he's riding uh, past room 237, they've got the that weird design in the carpet, which if you look at it top down, <laughs> looks exactly like the shuttle base that they would have launched it from. <laughs> There's other ones in there that I cannot remember. One of them having to be, I think, 237 is like the number of miles or something divided by this minus that. Try as hard as you want. You can get the outcome you desire. Right. Number 23 <laughs> up in here. Um, but I always thought that was that was one of my favorite ones because that guy really tried to make it work. And if you're cr just crazy enough, it makes sense, I guess. Um, but it's just... <laughs> I just like the idea that he's like, you know, Kubrick decided to make this movie so he could let everyone know. We faked it. Uh. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> nah. 
Um, so yeah, no, I, uh, my one thing about that I, I, I really enjoyed that I helped, I feel helped carry um, some of the, the tension and the setting of this whole entire movie all together back on that uh, was the kid, Danny. He just, overall, the whole entire movie, he just feels uncomfortable and has just those ominous vibes mm -hmm. about him. Um, specifically, I wrote down was one where uh, Jack tries to give him a hug. He's just like, yeah, hey. And he's just like, no. He doesn't want to go over there. No. Um, not only that, but he talks about Tony, the imaginary character who lives in his mouth, hides in his stomach, but talks through his finger, which... Mm -hmm. Strange. I don't understand it, but hey... It's cool. Imagine that seems me. more like one of them Stephen King things. <laughs> yeah. I, I well, mean, isn't it a book? Basically? It is, yes. Yeah, okay, yes, okay, yes. okay. But I mean, so it's it's apparently, it. it's apparently so different from the book that Stephen King himself hates that movie. Which That's what I've heard, that but I didn't look into that. <laughs> um, so I never really associated it with Stephen King, but yeah, he would have wrote the book. That's why it's always Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. But the, the Tony thing I always thought was... It's one of the reasons why... Nowadays, they probably would have just done a voiceover of the kids instead of how Tony doesn't want to talk right now. <laughs> it sounds like he's been smoking for 80 years. <laughs> I agree. Um, that's one of those those other strange things that I kind of wish got more explained, and I'm sure there's analysis out there we could read. But whatever Tony is, which is his shining, has some sort of connection to it, but I don't know what that connection is because he, he can foresee what's happening there even when they're not there. He says Jack's going to call and say he got the job. Right before Jack calls to say he has the job, it might have to. It might explain why he says that he's been there the whole time. Maybe Tony was the previous caretaker's kid's name or something. Maybe like that, you know? I don't know. Yeah. So. Um, and there's a lot of strange things that that Danny sees that is something that does come to pass. So a big thing is they replay the the blood coming out of the elevator. Mm -hmm. Danny sees it. I think two times maybe. Once before they're there and once while he's there. Mm -hmm. And he keeps just staring at the camera, not screaming, but doing the scared face. Um, and then at the end, when Wendy's running around, she turns that corner. And then that's when the blood actually comes out of the elevator. Mm -hmm. So he's not only able to communicate psychopathically or telepathically, telepathically, te telepathically um, but he can also somewhat see the future somehow with that shining. Which I thought was kind of interesting, but he—I don't—I guess he doesn't get to choose what it is. Otherwise, he probably would have been like, "Hey, maybe I shouldn't go into room 237. Crazy lady's gonna choke me." I still feel like it's like—I don't know. Maybe it's ingrained in me. I just feel like that's what it is. It's got to be the replay over and over. It's a rinse and repeat, rewind, restart. Here's the new story again, just different characters. We need Same shit, different day. We need uh, Zach Baggins to walk in and explain to us for the 800th time what a residual haunting is. <laughs> it's like a tape player. That's on a loop. <laughs> I'm Zach Baggins. <laughs> oh, fuck that guy. <laughs> um, overall, I don't think it's the most like scare per minute movie. No. It's not every two seconds there's a jump scare or something like that. I think it's it's definitely one of those movies that has a very slow, gradual build of just kind of first eeriness then unsettling then strange and then by the time it gets to the end shit just goes bananas I feel like that's really played with the time cards though too because it starts telling you one month in and then it goes by day by day and then it starts cutting down to the hours yep. to where it leads up to the moment mm -hmm. which is something that I always at, I guess at first I was kind of like why, you, why does it matter what day it is but it does show that rapid progression once once he has his first little mental break it just the madness starts swirling. snowball so bad yep. yeah um and it's it's kind of an interesting thought as to how long you can stay in one spot with no one else but those two people especially when they already have somewhat of a strained marriage to begin with mm -hmm. um and the timeline again doesn't add up because she says when jack initially hurt danny he said uh, he hasn't been drinking, drinking for, for five four, months or four five, months. Four or five months, yeah. But when he's at the bartender for the first time, he says it's been over a year or two. Mm, maybe so, that he's losing his mind already. At yeah, how time. long does he think he's been there? Is it again like, hey, you've been here forever, so your, your timelines don't add up with each other? Because both of those are said to two different people, so you're not 100% sure who's telling the truth because Wendy does kind of try to 
brushed under the rug. Mm. His abusive side. Seem like a violent man. Um, which does, I mean, come back to play later when Danny has the marks on his neck and she snaps. It gives a good reason for her to, to immediately jump to him. I mean, at first she thinks there's someone else in the, the hotel. And then she, I don't believe she's seen anything strange. And no one's been telling her anything. So it would make sense for her previously to have had that experience to then jump to him. Which I think is one of the best parts about this movie is everything, no matter what is going on, all comes together. Whether it's the, the Native American overture or um, the things that have been brought up previously always have the resolution at the end. I feel like other than a few things that are left to the imagination for, for specific reasons, everything gets kind of resolved. Yeah. Um, minus the ending, obviously. The biggest cliffhanger, like, what the fuck? But <laughs> for the most part, anything brought up comes back. True. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree. It can, wraps itself up. Yes. In a nice little bow. As nice as you'd want from a horror movie. <laughs> Which brings me to the next point is, would you consider it a horror movie or is it more of a, a, a suspense or a it thriller? It's listed or? as a drama horror, which I would agree with that. Um, I would almost give it thriller aspects just because it has a lot of that tension building where I guess in my book when I see horror, it's more of the scary building, not so much the tension building of a conclusion. It's consistent mm-hmm. throughout, but I would... Yeah, I, I'd say it has a touch of horror in it. And do you think that is just due to the time that has passed that everything we think horror now has to be Most likely. jumping out at you or constantly constantly having something All those chasing tropes. you? Yeah. yeah. Most likely. I mean, when you take a look back at those scary movies back in the 80s, not a lot of them were as... I guess they had slasher films, obviously, yeah. but a yeah. lot of the actual scary ones were more of a drama building till a conclusion. Say this movie came out 80, 80, uh, 82? This is 1980. 80? Okay. So the first slasher, or what people um, considered to be the first slasher, would have only came out a year or two prior. Halloween, I think, is 78 or 79. Um, so they hadn't gone fully down that rabbit hole of, we got to have the, the monster chasing Shock. somebody. Shocking. Um, although, I guess some people consider uh, Black Christmas the first slasher movie. Okay, so I've seen it. Besides the point. Um, I think the only reason I do consider it horror, other than for the most part, it would be a psychological horror. Like what it would be, you have to think what it would be like to be those people there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the last 10, 15 minutes where Jack goes full psycho definitely earns it the the horror. That's when you get the crazy man with the the sharp weapon chasing people down while they scream. That's what I think of as horror, mostly due to what I've been uh, shown before to be called horror. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think they do that part really well. Every time it gets to that part, I always forget how intense it is, and I'm just like, "Oh shit! Oh fuck! It's <laughs> happening! It's happening!" You're chopping that. <laughs> you're chopping those doors down. Which another fun fact: Jack Nicholson uh, was trained as a firefighter at some point, apparently. So they initially had uh, breakaway doors for him to chop down. Oh, but he didn't. Have the no, he was ripping through them in like two or three strokes. <laughs> and they're like, fuck, we need to give him a real door because it's really ruining our tension here. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Um, something I don't know how much I want to talk about because it's uncomfortable. Is this movie kind of like it's kind of racist? A little bit. Little I think bit. it's a movie for its time, though. It definitely ages itself. Uh, one part I actually wrote down for that was. Obviously, the use of that hard R word. Twice. But, Three uh, times. Three times. Yes. Trace. Um, Trace R's. They're smoking inside. And just kind of casually, like, when uh, Wendy's talking to this, the, the lady, mm-hmm. she's like, he offers a cigarette and just starts lighting up in front of her as if yep. it's no big deal, where nowadays, obviously, that's like, whoa, hey, no, don't do that. And Grady, who he's talking to, would have been from the, the 20s, I believe, anyways, which that mm-hmm. I guess that verbiage would have been a bit m- more common, but it's just so it's, jarring now to... To hear that both cringy, them, both I was just like, oh shit, I forgot about that. Uh, and then the only person that actually gets killed is uh, uh, Scatman Crothers. It's sitting with that old timey trope of yep. horror movies. Yep. <laughs> Poor guy. It. Uh, he didn't deserve it. Yeah, I like it so much. <laughs> it's one of the scariest though. The the probably the biggest jump scare of the whole movie though is when he's he's uh, running through. And Jack goes behind that pillar and comes out and guts him with the with the axe. There's one thing I wrote on here was, um, as he's breaking through the door, he's very determined to get into that door. He got into the door, he reaches in, get his hand slashed, 
that completely cuts off his drive, and he just decides to turn around and leave. Because well, he got cut on the hand. No, see, while that's ha- after he gets cut, that's when they hear the the snowcat come up. They both hear the motor, and they're looking. So I think his initial idea is, I need to get the drop on whoever is coming. Because it can't be a, a whole mess of people, most likely, with how secluded it is. Um, plus, he's just insane. <laughs> so he's probably like, oh, I gotta go kill these people so I can kill my wife. That's kind of what I wrote in there, though. Like, he was seemed pretty driven at that. Um, he got cut in the hand, but he seemed pretty determined to drive that axe into Dick. Yeah. So, yeah, no. I, I mean, still, I, I, I feel... In, in the shoes of a deranged man, mm. maybe I would continue on my business and then deal with what is yeah. to come being... You know, but well, hey. that would be a sane, crazy person, which <laughs> doesn't exist. True. The the one thing I thought would have been interesting, though, is if if he doesn't kill Dick, nobody dies in this movie. Which would be really interesting for a horror movie to have nobody die. I mean... But still be terrifying. Jack does die at the end. That's true. I mean, I would, I would assume... Yeah. That most embarrassing yeah. pose. Nobody gets killed. <laughs> How about that? Um, and that, I think, is probably some of his... Or, I don't know if I would say it's his best acting, but it's some of my favorite acting is him just, like... Ru- I, running's not the right word for it, but shambling. limping and shambling and stumbling through that maze, just screaming for Danny, and then it, it just becomes more and more unintelligible. He's just yelling at nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian! Um, I, I think it's fantastic. Uh, is there... Is there anything we haven't touched on that you have in your notes that, that you specifically want to want to touch upon? Uh, not so much, I don't think. I think um, maybe with the whole concept of him being here the whole time, he has that ability to talk to... Grand, yes, maybe it's because he's going insane. Mm-hmm. But he has that ability to talk to the ghosts mm-hmm. and just interact with them as if it's not a big deal. So maybe that's his insane brain that's been there the whole time that has that ability to react. He and, just didn't know he had the shining? Exactly. Which would explain who passed it on to Danny. Yeah. Because Dick talks about his grandmother having it, and they would talk without ever opening their mouths. Absolutely. And maybe that's why, well, maybe... Uh, maybe it's But Lenny. Wendy sees it, too, though. Yeah. At the end, she sees she sees all that stuff. She goes into the room that has True. all the spider webs and the skeletons, and she sees Grady, and... Yeah. So maybe... I would, I would guess if he doesn't have The Shining, then those ghosts can just make themselves known and interact. Maybe that's why Danny's so uncomfortable with with Jack, because maybe Danny can read Jack's thought. That's just something maybe. they don't play. Maybe. Um, but yeah, no, that's I think that's basically all I've got written, other than just some of the things like the long shot might be foreshadowing in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. Like, if you haven't heard of this film or haven't seen this film, if it's your very first get-go right away the disorienting music with the shots and all that just kind of starts to lead you right into something that's crazy and it really does a good job of showing just how secluded it is like the long road that they have to take up there and then when Jack's driving back and he's already irritated by Danny (laughs) I'm hungry well you should have eaten your breakfast (laughs) Um, I do like how throughout the course of of the movie if you obviously if you don't know what's going on they kind of keep it under wraps as to if, if it is really haunted or if it's Jack losing his mind up until a certain point and then eventually you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's haunted. But how much of it is the ghost's influence on him and how much is it that Jack is just insane? And do they just feed off each other maybe? Most um, likely. Because he's already kind of aggressive towards his family. Absolutely. But until he has that talk with Grady in the bathroom about his family not doing what he told him to and then having to deal with them, he's not too violent with them. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, very beginning, you already kind of noticed the man is a deranged man. It just kind of I don't say accelerates the madness, but mm-hmm. it's like he's the prime component to falling victim to the ghost's desires or Maybe. something like that. Yeah, I- um, it's kind of maybe like hypnotism, where you have to have that little bit of you that wants to be hypnotized. Yeah. Yep. So he he was already had he was already susceptible, like I said, to. Oops. Ghosts. <laughs> Goddamn ghosts. <laughs> Did it say what uh, what book he was trying to write on his nope. story? Never nope. really explained it. No, nope. it just says he's working on a new story. Hmm. Um. Which to me is strange because I I always forget that he used to be a, a teacher. Mm-hmm. And now he's going to be an author. So I don't know if he's previously wrote one or this is his first go at it. And it turns out he just can't can't do it. Writer's block drives him crazy. 
Honestly, the first couple times I saw this movie, I wasn't sure what his his whole point of being at this house was. I Other just thought maybe writing. he was trying to be a writer, finding seclusion. But and then I found he's a caretaker, yep. which I'm, still I don't know if that would have been a good choice to have a caretaker. Why not just shut the whole building down? But because I mean, what's going to happen to it? Um, it sounds like mostly it's dealing, making sure like the the furnacing and everything else is running properly. Uh, with how long they shut that down, and I didn't do five the, months. Month, okay, five months. If something goes wrong in month three, that's a long time for other things to go bad because of it. So they, it's just a plot device. I don't I know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, is it? Would you say it's fair to call this the most iconic horror movie of all time? With my limited viewing of a lot of older horror movies, yeah, I'd say so. It's got a lot of tropes, I don't say tropes, but it's got a lot of things in it that a lot of other movies have pulled from. Yep. Um, I would definitely say that it it's it's a big influencer. Say the, generally, the other ones I would think of as being iconic horror would be like, you know, The Exorcist, um, the original Halloween, some newer movies, maybe like the original Saw, things that would have changed a lot. Um, or some of the weird, like, Freddy, Jason, stuff like that. But I think, per iconic scene, I don't know if there's a movie that has more. So you've got the All Work and No Play makes Jack a dull boy. Um, you've got Here's Johnny. <laughs> um, you've got the ending with him frozen, looking all grumpy. You've got a whole mess of, of things that are are just famous in their own right. So people who haven't even seen the movie have probably seen that referenced in something or else. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think it might be the most iconic horror movie of all time. Um, but was it good? Did you like it, I should say? Um, I'll put it on my I liked it, but I don't know if I'd go out of my way to watch it only because it's two and a half hours. With credits. Other than that, uh, I don't know. I liked it. I enjoyed it. It was a good horror movie. I mean, maybe if I had to watch it again, I would if it was on. But if I had other things to do, I might just do something else. And that I would agree with you on the on the runtime. Obviously, I I don't have any issue with long movies. With how much I like Lord of the Rings and The Godfather, long movies are okay with me. But for a horror movie, it does seem fairly long, and they. I think it, in this case, it does work in its advantage to really drag that out. So when the shit does hit the fan, it does seem extra, extra emphatic. Mm-hmm. Um, but two hour horror movie is, is pretty crazy when most of them nowadays are about an hour, hour and a half or so. I usually think with the two hour movie, there's a lot of setup of narrative mm-hmm. and what's going on. Whereas this one, it's just, these are the events. There's no backstory. There's no... Yep leading up to I guess there kind of is a backstory but it's really kind of crash course to you in the beginning and the rest is just setting it up um so we might as well start to wrap it up with your what the fuck moment of The Shining as you said earlier it's that the weird door scene with the uh dog pig costume man I believe it's a bear blowing the dude on the bed I assume he's blowing him and just it looks very much like he's doing yes. that yes I, I would say it is a a cosplayer performing fellatio on a businessman is what it looks like to me Can say, shoot, um, and that is something that uh, like you said was I don't wouldn't say parodied but referenced in in The Kill by The Shining as well as a couple other places I that I can't remember off the top of my head but I know I've seen um, at least referenced uh, my what the fuck moment was the tub scene. Do you care to to give us a, a recap over what happens in the tub scene? I fell asleep. <laughs> um, so basically, what happens is Danny says he was attacked by that woman. So Jack decides to go check it out. He goes into room two thirty seven, starts calling out, no one responds, and then he goes into the bathroom. And there's a naked lady in there. Looks like her mid-twenties. Boobs, vagina, full Stanley Kubrick nudity. Um, it's the best part. And she kind of just walks up to him and they start making out. And then he's getting all handsy and he starts noticing it feels wrong. And it kind of pans back out. And she has got open sores and decay mm. and all sorts of grossness. And now she's like in her mid-sixties. And she's got boobs down to here. And she's just like, 
She, she pulls a Melisandre on him. Yeah, hardcore, <laughs> hardcore Melisandre. Um, and he starts screaming and runs off, and then he ends up uh, saying, "Yeah, I think Danny made the whole thing up. There's no one there. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't happen. No, I think he made it up oh. just like just like that other time. Um, I, the first time I watched it, I was like, nice." <laughs> nice. Oh, not nice. Not nice. I regret everything. <laughs> so gross. Which is kind of the same reaction I had to Melisandre. Yeah, absolutely. Although I had already seen her multiple times in the in the previous episodes. Um, so, what was then your favorite scene? Favorite overall scene. Honestly, I would just have to say was when. Danny's kind of touring the whole place. I don't know. I it, it took me. I tried to imagine myself if I was in his shoes as a kid. That would be so fun. I never had a, a big wheel. Sadly, so depressingly, no. I had hand me downs. I had a scooter. How do you but have hand me downs as an only child? <laughs> my my dad's sister in law, my aunt. I guess she she was young enough. But anyway, yeah, no. Uh, I thought it would be a lot of fun to do that in an open area. It's always been my dream of mine to go and like empty malls and stuff and mm. do that. But yeah, I'd love to skateboard little, around stuff like that. To be a little kid with a big wheel, that would be great. So honestly, I yeah, just it kind of it took me into a more immersive state, mm. but at the same time with the uneasy feeling knowing that it's a horror movie. <laughs> so my favorite scene is the first time he meets Lloyd in the bar. Which you also were asleep for. You fell asleep for 15 minutes of my favorite favorite 15 minutes, <laughs> I, I guess. Um, it is the, I think, the moment that he completely snaps. So he walks in, Lloyd's at the counter, serves him some drinks. Um, nothing, nothing too sinister about it. But just the conversation they have and the way he's kind of laughing at his own jokes and does his, his crazy Jack Nicholson laugh and all that stuff. Um, and, and the surrounding with the gold and the red. I just, something about that scene always grabs me. Um, always immediately start focusing in on it. If I'm watching it while something else is going on, I'll always turn and watch that scene for whatever reason. Um, and that brings us to MVP. Boy, honestly, did you not come prepared? I didn't think. I totally forgot we do MVP moments. I just had my what the fuck moment. <laughs> did you fall asleep during your MVP? I mean, obviously, I guess I probably would have. I probably would have picked that naked lady. If you would like a second to to think about it, my MVP was Jack Nicholson's eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's my MVP in any movie with Jack Nicholson. That's a good one. That just. The way that they make that man look extra crazy, especially when he's lit from below. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. He has the angle. Yep. The sinister angle. When he's laughing in the bars up, uh, lighting him up from below, or when he's got his head up against the, um, the, the door when she's locked him in. Just everything about those eyebrows, man. Crazy. It. This still puts me in a spot there. I mean, I guess now fully understanding Wendy and her whole aspect, maybe I just go with her um, to play someone who was probably put through a lot of shit on the set on top of maybe through Jack himself. You disgust me. She toughed it out. You disgust me. Disgusting. Could have at least picked Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> He's got better, got better MVP spots, different movies. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I like the Clockwork Orange. It is. It's pretty good. But I think <laughs> as a movie, it's a bit disjointed. Um, definitely more of an experimental movie from him, in, in my my opinion. Still like it a lot, but I would I would put The Shining as probably my favorite. I have not seen Eyes Wide Shut, though, which I would love to watch sometime. I have not seen that. Sometime. Heard of it. Anyways, that will do it for this spooktacular episode of Dudes Watch a Movie Podcast. Uh, I have been the notorious G-I-N-G. And I am your today's host, Ted Sprocket. Uh, join us next time when we watch another movie, which we don't know yet. Anyways, thanks for watching. Take care.